Good evening and welcome to a special Thanksgiving edition of Vital People. Tonight we want to thank all the people across Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands who make this such a wonderful place to live. And we start in the Cowichan Valley at a therapeutic farm that's changing lives. I was diagnosed in 1980, uh, bipolar affective disorder with schizophrenic tendencies. Life was a struggle for a young Bill Baker until he moved to a psychiatric group home in the Cowichan Valley in 1983. And the first day I was there was a Thursday and the following day was the Friday program here at the farm. So right now the very popular things are cherry tomato baskets. That day, Bill began horticultural therapy at Providence Farm. It was the vision of the then director of mental health in Duncan that people with mental health issues and disabilities are better served working in the land than they are in a building, in an institution. In 1979, the Sisters of St. Anne gifted this 162 hectare property to the Cowichan Valley. Providence Farm now has 34 full and part-time staff and 130 clients benefiting from their programs. We have a woodworking shop, we have a small engine repair shop, we have a general store, we have a clothing outreach program, we have textiles therapy where you learn to knit or sew or weave. We have art therapy, we have a kitchen program. And the greenhouse. Therapeutic horticulture it played a very big part in my health. In the psychiatric business, there's a thing called the revolving door syndrome. They feel better, they're taking good meds, they feel great, so it's like the common flu. Stop taking your meds. And then six months later, you're back on the fourth floor in the psych ward. But not Bill. Give it lots of water. Since that first day in 1983, Bill has volunteered at the farm every Friday. He met his wife here. They now have two children. And since 91, he's been employed by the farm, working in the nursery. It's hard to define miraculous. Um, we have people that would tell you we've saved their lives. You know, whether that's a miracle, what would they have done without Providence Farm, I can't say. But I do know we've impacted thousands of people's lives in a positive way. What a legacy from the Sisters of St. Anne. Now, you know, the Sisters purchased those 400 acres back in 1864. And back then, the Okanagan wasn't considered the fruit-growing capital of the province. It was southern Vancouver Island. And now, all that's left of a lot of those majestic orchards is fruit trees growing on boulevards and backyards and fruit that might rot on the ground. Until now. Since 1999, LifeCycle's fruit tree project has been rescuing unwanted harvest. People who have fruit trees in their yards that they don't have the time or energy or resources to pick all the fruit, they um, sign up their trees with us and we send out teams of volunteers to come and pick the fruit. With 200 volunteers from age 18 to 78, last season alone, LifeCycle's collected over 17,000 kilograms of fruit. That's 39,000 pounds. That fruit is then shared amongst the homeowners, the volunteers, different community organizations, and some gets processed to, that we, into products we can sell to keep our organization going. Everybody gains from this. You know, the homeowner gains, and life cycles gains, and the pickers gain too. Yep. These two boxes. A lot of apples, a lot of pears, a lot of plums, a few cherries at the beginning of the year. Um, figs, quince, um, some nuts, some kiwis. And the list goes on and on. Homeowners register with Life Cycles, confirm their trees have not been sprayed with pesticides, then call when their fruit is ripe. A lot of homeowners pick what they want to eat, but they don't. not everyone has the time to process or can vast amounts of fruit. Well, I just moved to the area a couple of years ago and I would noticed a lot of apples on the ground and uh, going to waste and I was talking about that with a friend. That friend told Jim about life cycles and Jim signed on to help. <laughs> Pickers share 25% of the pick, homeowners another 25% in boxes left on their doorstep, but the biggest beneficiary are those who need it most. The mustard seed, our place, different food banks, um, shelters, community organizations, Sandwich Neighborhood Place, for example, community houses. If you have fruit trees that need picking or time on your hands to help pick, go to our website, checknews.ca, and click on links to learn more about life cycles. 
From delicious, shiny fruit, we move on to wet, slimy creatures. And I'll bet any teacher who's had the pleasure of bringing Sequoia volunteers into their classroom is very thankful. Let's go to the beach now, the one with four walls and a chalkboard. Yeah, so how can you tell the difference between the two of them? These grade six students are studying at the beach. Well, the next best thing, anyway. We live in Vancouver Island. We're surrounded by water. And we all know the issues that are happening with our environment. It's really important that our kids are connected to the environment. It's really becoming a cornerstone of, of education. It has lots of tube feet and it's fuzzy. It's called Sequoia in Schools, a program created by World Fisheries Trust to educate young minds on local marine ecosystems. Schools participating in the program are entrusted with an aquarium which students take care of. Every month or so, volunteers from Sequoia arrive to teach another hands-on lesson about our oceans. Teachers and students alike are very excited for the opportunity to have experiential learning, a chance to um, touch and see and smell and uh, look at all these things that they would normally just see in books or something like this. I think it's really cool. Remember when we were at the sea cucumber, like rolled over and then it was like really disgusting. This actually is the stomach right here. That's part of it. And when we go down to the beach, the kids make connections to what they've seen in these tubs. You know, they, there's a chitin, there's a, a scallop, there's a sea star, um, there's a, a sea lemons, you know, a nudibranch. So they, they make those connections and, and the world opens up for them. Citron lemon, de mer of the sea. And you heard right. There's an extra learning component for these French immersion students. And you're learning it en français, mais oui, how is that going? Ah, uh, difficile. It's just another layer of learning offered by Sequoia. And as you can see, it applies to a lot of different, different areas. So not just science or biology or the environment, but also you can use it to learn about French or art or socials. And like sponges, the students absorb it all. The sea star, it like shoots its stomach around the clam or scallop and then digest it. Oh. World Fisheries Trust hopes that by educating young people about our fragile oceans, they are creating adults who will fight to preserve it. So you just saw what it's like to take a beach into the classroom. How about taking the classroom into the forest? When we come back, we'll meet a group of little ones who will be keeping their boots and jackets on for the whole day. And did you know there's a garden being planted underwater? When we come back, we'll take you to Cowichan Bay. But just before we go to break on this Thanksgiving Monday, we asked you, what are you thankful for? What am I thankful for? I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my family and my friends and my dog. I'm thankful for my family. I am thankful for the fact that I have a loving husband and a loving family and uh, lots of prayers and support from the community for my business. Welcome back. So what do turkey, gravy, and running shoes have in common? They're all part of Victoria's Thanksgiving weekend. Yesterday was the 34th annual Good Life Fitness Victoria Marathon. We are thankful to all the volunteers who make that race happen and to all the charities that the race supports because every step counts. Oh, don't leave them hanging, don't leave them hanging. <laughs> There's a special feeling in this gym, a feeling of friendship, fun, and pride. Today is 100 sessions for Viola. Because everyone here has overcome significant challenges. Four years ago, I had a double lung infection, which um, just about could have taken my life. I uh, couldn't even afford a pair of runners when I started coming out, and you know, running is supposed to be one of the easiest things to do. I, I was smoking before I came, and then when I started running, I, I, I quit smoking. There we go. Housed within the Kool-Aid Society in downtown Victoria, this running program really is changing lives. Every Step Counts is a walking and running program for individuals who self-identify with challenges with mental health, addiction, poverty, social isolation and other barriers. This program is on the ground making a difference for so many people in our neighborhood and it's, it's great getting people into walking and running and that lifestyle. After surviving a collapsed lung, Lorraine Walton began walking with Every Step Counts three years ago. I remember just standing there holding at the windowsill, looking at people coming out onto Douglas Street from Beacon Hill Park. And I went, oh, I'd love to do that. My mom says, you can. If you want to, you'll do it. Here I am. I run them, and I love it. It it's actually feels pretty good just to leave, leave uh, the troubles of the day behind for that, that, that a bit of time. 
and, and it really helps when I'm done just to kind of be more grounded and relaxed. I sleep a lot better because I'm exercising a lot more and it's really helping with my stress levels as well. We've got some people who move on from Every Step Counts back into school or use a, do Every Step Counts and go to school or back into the workforce uh, and some people who really just use it as sort of a way to sort of keep themselves on even keel in terms of their mental health. So if you see the Every Step Counts t-shirts running through downtown Victoria, give them the cheer of encouragement they deserve. Congratulations to everyone who ran in yesterday's marathon, which goes ahead every year regardless of the weather. And that sounds a little similar to the philosophy of the Victoria Cridge Center's new nature preschool. Just another day of preschool fun for these four and five year olds. Nature preschool, to be exact. The children love being outside. There's so many things to explore and learn. I wonder if we can figure out how to climb that big tree. I wonder if anybody can figure that out. This morning is a mix of outdoor and indoor play. Well, you get that but starting this fall, the Cridge Center for the Family is launching their nature preschool, and the children will be outside the whole time. They learn in different ways when they're outside. They uh, are more interested in the biology and physics of their outdoor surroundings. Where are the uh, caterpillars? Up, up, up in the tree. They're obviously more physically engaged, they're more active. Please get this down, guy. Which leads to physically fit children, to children who just generally are loving to be outdoors in the fresh air and playing. I love my wet shoes. Enjoying nature under overcast skies is one thing, but let's be honest, this is the wet west coast. The philosophy of the nature preschool will be there's no bad weather, there's just bad clothing. So we do have some donations already to help parents get suitable clothing, um, muddy buddies, rain gear, whatever they need. So the children can really be out interacting with nature through all the seasons. And while the Cridge Centre doesn't encourage owners to walk their dogs on the beautiful Gary Oak Meadow property, the preschool teachers do realize this is yet another teachable moment. Learning about approaching them correctly and, and getting to know them, it definitely is a very positive um, interaction for the children. And positive interaction with nature is what this preschool is all about. <laughs> so you saw those adorable kids weaving their way through the tall grass? Well, that's exactly what salmon do underwater. And we all need to thank the volunteers of Sea Change for the work they're doing in Cowichan Bay. This is a marine flag most of us living on the West Coast recognize. It means caution, diver below, or in this case, gardener below. What we're doing is taking eelgrass from a healthy bed, which is just right in front of us here, and putting it out into areas where it's completely gone. Eelgrass grows in shallow water, forming meadows on the seafloor. It slows wave action to prevent the erosion of sand from our shorelines and provides food and shelter for everything from crabs to salmon. Our salmon need eelgrass from when they are coming down the streams before they hit open ocean. They need to spend a couple months in the estuary to get bigger. So the eelgrass is the primary place where they are able to gather their food and hide. But it's disappearing. The Cowichan Bay has very little eelgrass left. 100 years of logging uh, and human recreational use in the estuary has wiped it out in almost entirety. And so, for the past decade, volunteers from Sea Change Marine Conservation Society have been restoring eelgrass beds, Here. gently removing just enough shoots to leave current beds healthy and plant new ones. We put the little washer on here, just up beyond where the uh, last lot of roots are. Eelgrass shoots actually float, so the anchors are needed to hold them down. And the divers plant them so the anchors are just underwater. And they plant them in clumps of 10 shoots, one meter apart. So is it working? The education piece has been very successful. A lot of the volunteers have never heard of it before and just want to help out in the Couch and Bay area. Restoration is difficult. It's better to conserve what we already have than to try and restore what's already gone. It has been very successful in the past. Some of the old statistics show 80% um, growth from a planted bed. But this dive brought a disheartening discovery. Transplant sites from 2008 and 2009 were gone. There were no, no shoots left. 
just metal washers. It might have been geese eating the shoots, extreme low tides drying them out, or human intervention. Sea Change will try to get to the bottom of why they lost all those beds and keep working to reestablish this important plant habitat. And I just chatted with Sea Change about the loss of those plants. They say there are a few factors at play, but the major one they think is climate change, with more water flowing more heavily into the bay and washing away those plants. So they're moving them to other areas, and they're very thankful to the Cowichan tribes for all the help they're giving them with this project. When we come back, we're going to meet a software company volunteering their time and expertise to Victoria's Prostate Centre and a novel way to get books into the hands of the street community and more of what you're thankful for. Thankful for my family. Yeah, I'm, they're really important to me. I've got family all over the island and in the, in, in the, on the mainland. So. Yes, thanks for this planet, this beautiful city. I am thankful for my beautiful son and my growing family. It's a time that I always look forward to, to enjoying it uh, with the family and friends and to be thankful for all the things that we've had. I want to thank for, for my wife, my family, our three wonderful children. Uh, I've got a great son-in-law. Uh, you know, life's been great for me. Welcome back on this Thanksgiving Monday. And we're going to take you now to the Victoria Prostate Centre. You know, one in seven Canadian men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. But if caught early, there's a 90% survival rate. And that's something we are all thankful for. Once uh, gentlemen hear the word C, cancer, I think the world stops for a while. Good morning, Prostate Centre. The Victoria Prostate Centre supports men across Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands diagnosed with this cancer. We dispel the myths. There's a lot of myths on the internet and uh, often we go rushing there and we find out all these stories, many of which are not true and um, um, you know, misinformation really is not helpful when you're trying to make an important decision on what you're going to do. Jerry McQuaid was diagnosed in 2006. I came to the prostate center right away as soon as I was diagnosed and they helped me considerably to uh, work my way through as, as to what treatment option I should choose. This is when I had my surgery, my PSA was very high. Seven years ago, Jerry tracked everything to do with his disease in this booklet provided by the Prostate Centre. It was his lifeline. Depending on your treatment type, you will be able to go and go through and fill out questionnaires on how your treatment's going. And soon, thanks to a grant from the Victoria Foundation and a local software company volunteering their expertise, this is how prostate cancer patients will monitor their disease. They can see their, their medical records, any interactions they've had with physicians, including um, medical tests, doctor's notes, anything that's relevant to their treatment. There are many, many different options that one can pursue. It will be wonderful to have this information readily accessible at the computer in one's home. CGI plans a soft launch of the program this fall, tweaking the software with feedback from patients until it's market ready, hopefully next year. Another important way the Prostate Centre is supporting men and their families. A great project that's going to help a lot of men on their journey through cancer. Well, you're probably aware the 2013 Vital Signs Report is out. This is an incredibly thorough look at how Victorians feel about our city. Last year, our number one concern was homelessness. This year, that has dropped to number four, and that's a good thing. Victoria Foundation thinks it's because of all the support out there for our street community. For 25 years, Literacy Victoria has been helping people of all ages learn to read. We're the only one actually that offers free fundamental basic literacy skill training. So that's in literacy, reading, writing, math and other essential skills that people need in their everyday life. But a few years ago, volunteers realized they needed to reach out to those who won't come to them. And one of the ways we thought we might absolutely get to the most marginalized individuals in our community would be by setting up a bookmobile. Last year alone, bookmobile volunteers got more than 6,000 books into the hands of the less fortunate because a book is a great escape. Gets them sort of away from any issues that they might have to sit down and enjoy a good read. And if you like them, there's like a million titles. Every Tuesday, the little truck stops at various outreach organizations across Victoria, like the Salvation Army and Our Place. Well, I think it's very nice. 
because I, I don't know, I don't go to the library, so I don't have a library card. And People are waiting in advance and they'll say, what time do I need to be out there? So as soon as they pull up, there's people waiting for them. A street cat named Bob, how one man and his cat found hope on the street. There's a huge variety of subjects and authors. It's a weekly highlight for many. I think it's a great idea. I, they should have had this done a long time ago. It's really good. And the books are all in great shape. You can bring it back any time you want us. And for those who have so little, a book can mean so much. I could only see his feet sticking out from under the cardboard and all his blankets and everything else. But beside him was one of our books. And I thought, well, isn't that great? I mean, there's somebody, he had a little comfort and a little solace from one of our books. Sharing the joy of reading with the less fortunate week after week. All these amazing volunteers in our community. And you know, every story you've just seen has one big thing in common. All those organizations have been helped by the Victoria Foundation because their mandate is connecting people who care with causes that matter. But what if the organization needs an immediate funding boost? Well, that's now possible too. Pacific Opera Victoria has a $4 million annual budget with expenses of about $350,000 per month. And while POV is delighted to have paid off their debt... We also don't have cash on hand like any good business needs. So what's a nonprofit to do when you know the cash will come, through ticket sales in this case, but you need it now to fund the production? The flow of cash throughout the year is different in every charity, depending on how they get their revenues. And for us, February, March is low. For the last number of years, we've had organizations that would come to us that just need some bridge financing. And we just didn't have the ability to do that. And so the Victoria Foundation is launching Vital Loans in partnership with Island Savings. We're looking for ways of what could we do to uh, show our commitment to the community. And we saw this as just a really logical and, and, and great extension working with such a great partner such as the Victoria Foundation. The phone started already. And we've just said, well, we're just launching the program. And, you know, they have to qualify, too. They'll have to spend some time with Island Savings. And having a loan compared to a grant is, you know, looking at the ability for them to pay that back, how soon they need the funding, etc. The Victoria Foundation is one of 181 community foundations across Canada. The Toronto Foundation president was also in Victoria to announce a national initiative, a video library similar to YouTube where those who have money to donate can learn about groups in need. Where do you go to find out about those organizations that are doing impactful work in your community? Well, that type of knowledge is exactly what community foundations are all about. Whether you're in Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, or Victoria, we're all in the business of community knowledge. I come from here. And how is Toronto explaining to other communities what these vignettes will look like? Our whole family is quite multicultural. The whole idea is for them to grow up and become great men. Check News Vital People stories are the national model. I know from the Victoria Foundation standpoint, having a partner like Czech to help them bring that together, the storytelling is so important and that's your business and this is your way of helping build community through that. Because a strong, vibrant community helps everybody thrive. Well, thanks for watching our special edition of Vital People. I hope you've enjoyed meeting all the people across Vancouver Island that make us all so thankful to live here. From Beacon Hill Park, happy Thanksgiving.